Assalamu alaikum. That was like half of you. I made dua for you and you're not making dua back. The angels are, so alhamdulillah. But can we try that again? Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah here. Oh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I start by sending peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. May Allah grant him and his companions and his family and all of you the highest level of Jannah, inshallah. I thank Allah for giving me this opportunity to come today and speak with you and inshallah be a benefit to you and not uh, anything negative, inshallah. Um, so I'm here today talking about identity, finding yourself. The reverts in this room <laughs> will know this so well. And a lot of the born Muslims will too. And I'll go into like why I, I believe that is at this time. But let's talk about what identity is. Identity is the qualities, beliefs, personality traits, appearance, and or expressions of, character, of that character of a person. This is what your identity is in, in a, lingu a linguistic kind of sense, yeah? But pertaining to ourselves, your identity changes based on your perception of yourself and the perception of others onto you. Throughout our entire lives, we are essentially trying to find ourselves. From the time we are toddlers running into walls until teenagehood where you go off the rails and then adulthood when you finally kind of start to find your feet. And I, I even believe until death, we'll, we'll always be finding ourselves. Islam, the deen, it's not something that ever stops growing within us. It's not a knowledge that we can ever fully comprehend. We'll be learning and growing and changing until we meet Allah. And what you're essentially trying to do when you are finding yourself is you're trying to fill a void. And you fill that void through experiences and relationships with other people. And this is how your character develops throughout time. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 3, Today I have perfected your faith for you, completed my favor upon you, and chosen Islam as your way. The verb that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses is raditu. I have chosen. This tells us that he has made Islam sufficient for us in his perfect completion of it through our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Quran. As a revert, and even as a born Muslim and a human being throughout your life, identity sometimes goes into crisis mode. And especially as a revert. Now I'm a revert, so I'm gonna speak about it from a revert's perspective, but I'm sure all the born Muslims in here can probably also find parallels in their own journeys to this. So when you first convert to Islam, you are bombarded. <laughs> You're bombarded with demands of who you are supposed to be in the perception of the Muslims around you. You're told you shouldn't do that, you should do this, you have to do this, what is this, when are you going to do this? And it can be so overwhelming. It can feel like you're drowning because all of a sudden you have assumed a completely new identity that you don't quite understand yet. And you cannot understand until you take time to grow into that new identity. As you're being pushed out of your old life, your old community, your friends, your family, everything you knew about the world, and being dragged into this new community, this new way of life, this new understanding of what is important and what isn't, what should I do and what shouldn't I do. This very crucial time in every revert's life is a make or break moment. A lot of new Muslims go in overzealous. You know, we dive head first in. Sometimes we go to the super Salafi sides and then we find our way back into a healthy medium. Sometimes we go the other way and find our way back to a healthy medium. But it's so crucial in this time, as the Muslim community, to support reverts in the right way. Now in my own perception of the community, 
I would say almost every Muslim who has grown up in the last 20, 30 years is somewhat a revert. We live currently in this, this dunya that we live in is very different than the dunya 50 years ago, yeah? We are, I mean, shaitan has been playing the long game and this is the end of that, you know? He has been building a society that is so well catered to the jahiliya that especially those who are teenagers now, those who are in their young 20s are so tempted by the pulls of the jahiliya, whether it's girls or boys or social media or intoxicants or, you know, the, the, the lifestyles that they see on TV. It's so important for them to actually choose Islam as their way. And a lot of the time they don't. You know, between those teenage to early 20 years, a lot of people are in the jahiliya, even if they were born into Muslim families. And then maybe in the late 20s, they'll start to, you know, find their way back and, and realize what's important. And it usually comes when they want to get married, but, you know, whatever gets you there. <laughs> But I believe that every Muslim nowadays growing up is a revert in a sense that they have chosen the deen over jahiliya, over the dunya. So hopefully you can find you know, some, some parallels in, the, in what I'm about to speak about, inshallah. So, I'm gonna talk about me. I'm gonna talk about my story Insha'Allah. Um, before Islam, I converted to Islam when I was 22 years old. It was about 10, 11 years ago now, alhamdulillah. Um, if you <laughs> ever saw me in my jahiliya, you would not recognize me for sure. My own friends don't recognize me nowadays. I was the typical party girl. I was the bikini in a music festival, not a care in the world living to die young and all that dumbness, <laughs> to be honest. I was, for the most part, probably pretty self-centered and I was a staunch atheist. I was the person in the group who would laugh at religion and say, you are crazy for believing there's some man in the sky who's looking out for you and created all of this with my sarcastic undertones. Um, I wasn't a bad person in any sense of the word, I don't think. I was just lost and broken in many, many ways. It's funny, I don't know if any of you look back at you know, your pictures from your 20s or your late teens, and you remember yourself as a certain way. You know, I look back and I think, oh, you know, I was, I was so free and happy and, and I was the life of the party and I was the funny one. And you know, I, ju I just thought I was just living life. But when I truly look back at pictures now of me when I was in my early 20s, I don't see that anymore. I actually see in my face that I was broken. I was truly broken and lost and sad. And I was covering it all up with partying, with intoxicants, with anything to escape this dunya that I was so desperately living for, subhanAllah. May Allah keep us all far from that state. It is not a good one. And it's, it's something that I like to talk to the youth today about because they are so tempted by that life, but it's pure emptiness. So if shaitan ever comes and says, hit up that, that music festival, don't. <laughs> from my experiences, don't. So at that time, all of my friends were from that lifestyle. I did not have a single friend that I hadn't met at a party. And so when I accepted Islam, even though most of my friends were Muslim, they were, I was living in Malaysia and literally 98% of my friends were, were born Muslim, not practicing except Ramadan usually. Um, but they were all from that lifestyle and that's what we had in common, you know, that we liked to party. And so when I converted to Islam, I found myself completely unable to connect with anyone who I was with anymore. And they felt like red flags, you know? They felt like they were going to tempt me back to that life. That if I kept hanging out with them, I would slowly, slowly find my way back into that life and leave the Dean. So I'm gonna take a step back. 
Some of you may know me. Uh, I run a YouTube channel, Victoria of Islam. Um, some of you may have heard my revert story, but some of you may not. So I will take a couple of minutes to just tell you kind of the story, and then I'll go into the identity crisis that came after, and I'll go more deeply into that. So as I said, I was living in Malaysia at the time, um, and I had just recently moved into a new house. And my best friend was over from Canada visiting me. And I had a housewarming party, I had some friends over, a barbecue, having a great time. I went upstairs to show my friends the upstairs level of my new house and left my best friend downstairs. And as I was coming out of the second bedroom, I heard a loud bang and my dog bark. Now my dog's crazy, so I just assumed she knocked something over as usual. As I went downstairs, I saw my best friend, who is half black, turned completely white, sitting and staring at the glass sliding door at the front of my house. So we're having a barbecue, everything was open. We had the glass sliding door and the front wooden door. The wooden door was open and the glass door was shut. And I asked my friend what had happened and she said, your dog was walking towards the glass sliding door and the door slammed shut in front of her face without anyone touching it. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so we got scared and we left. And we went out like we do, got a little bit intoxicated like we do, and forgot all about it. Now my best friend left the country, and I was still in that house. And over the next couple of months, things kept happening inside this house, but I would make excuses for them. So I left that there when I went out, and now it's there. Oh, I just forgot, I must have moved it before I left. I'm sitting in my room alone at night, and something drops in my room. I can hear it. Nothing's moved. Oh, it's just the, just the neighbors. I can just hear the neighbors through the wall. Until one night, something happened that I could no longer excuse. <laughs> I came home one night from my friend's birthday party, and I got ready for bed in my room. I'd put my dog in her room, I was in my room, and I realized that the light was on outside of my bedroom door. So I went out to turn it out, off. And when I went out, I felt a feeling. And this feeling I had felt once before in my life when I was a young teenager, about 13, 14 years old. And this feeling had come to me before when I went out with my brother's friend who liked to practice black magic. <laughs> and he really was into the ghost and spirit world. So we went out one night and he said, I'm gonna take you to Ghost Corner. And I was 14 and I was dumb. So I was like, do it. <laughs> and we sat there and he started doing his like seance and like calling on the spirits and all that. And I felt this feeling. And this feeling is like a gripping feeling in your chest, maybe where you think your soul resides. And I'd felt it, and I said nothing, until he looked me dead in the eye and said, leave. And I was like, oh, why? <laughs> and he said, there's something here that doesn't like you. You should leave. And I believed him 100% because I knew that what I felt was real, and I took off out of there. So I was sitting, standing in my room, you know, almost a decade later, feeling the same feeling and automatically recognizing it because I'd never felt it ever again after that time. And I couldn't see anything. And maybe I heard something like white noise. It wasn't a sound and it wasn't not a sound. But I felt where it was coming from. I could feel like the energy where it was coming from. And it didn't help that I had like Japanese horror movie ceiling, like very tall, like hallway ceiling. So again, I got terrified and I slammed my bedroom door and I locked it because locks and ghosts, that's the way you protect yourself, right? <laughs> Couldn't do anything else. And I turned my back and something hit the door so hard behind me that the whole door shook. I love this sister's face, by the way. You are encouraging every moment of my story. <laughs> She's looking at me like, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> And so something hit my door so hard and it just shook completely behind me. And my heart dropped to the floor. And in this moment, little atheist Vicky was completely alone in the world and had nothing to protect her. But subhanAllah, the only word that was in my mind was Allah. It wasn't God, it wasn't Buddha, it wasn't any of these other things that I've learned about. It was only Allah. And so against my normal judgment, which is never to call on God whenever I'm gonna die, <laughs> I 
felt it was the only thing I could do in that moment. And I said, Allah, if you're there, save me. So I went to my bed and I turned on South Park because that'll distract your mind. <laughs> and I closed my eyes and I fell asleep so quickly, so amazingly quickly. I usually take a while to sleep naturally, but I just went straight to sleep. And it poured rain that night. It purified all the house around me. And when I woke up in the morning, I had to kind of assess <laughs> what had happened the night before. So I sat on the side of my bed and I made my first dua. And I said, first of all, Allah, if you're there, thanks. <laughs> thanks for saving me last night. And if you exist, and if this is what you want for me, then you have to guide me. Because no one, no human being, I'm stubborn, I'm very stubborn, no human being could ever convince me that there is a God. And so Allah, if this is what you want for me, then guide me. And after that, I felt an amazing pull to learn about Islam. And I started to ask people close to me who looked like the most knowledgeable about Islam. I asked questions like, why do you pray? What are you afraid of? What does Islam teach us? What does Allah want from us? And I started to beta test Islam in my life. And it's amazing when you look back, I call it the stepping stones. And if you look back at your life to see where you've gotten to today, it's quite beautiful how Allah lays out your path. And so in the next couple of months, Allah put me in situations where I quit drinking, months before I even accepted Islam. I started to test things like patience, and I started to see the reward of being patient for the sake of Allah. And as I put these things into my life, I started to not be able to find any reason to believe that it isn't the truth. And so Ramadan was coming around, and as I saw from all my friends, Ramadan is the time to be a Muslim. And so I decided in Ramadan I would be 100% Muslim and see whether this is something that I can do. Because my personality is not 50%. If I do something, I do it all the way or I don't do it at all. And I didn't want to be like the, the people that I'd seen, you know, that they only practice in Ramadan, but they don't eat pork, but they party. Like, it's... Yeah. <laughs> May Allah guide us all and make sure that we do not, you know, sacrifice and compromise our beliefs for this dunya. And so Ramadan came and I found myself all alone learning about Islam. So I bought a hijab and I printed out how to pray and I fasted every day and I read a juz of the Quran every day. And about halfway through Ramadan, after Isha prayer, I was sitting alone and I thought, if I die tonight, I'm going to Jahannam. I have read about myself over and over and in this Quran, those who are blind, even though the truth is right in front of them. And so I Googled, how do you say your Shahada? <laughs> and I said it there, me and Allah alone, just like we'd started our journey. And I said my Shahada by myself that night, Alhamdulillah. So that's my story. So I found myself there, like everyone else, bombarded by information, Bombarded by support, you know, that first moment when you convert, everybody wants to get in on that ajr. Like, oh, let me get you your first prayer mat. Let me give you your first Quran. Yeah, every, every word you read is going to be my ajr. Everyone's really excited about that. Give me a hug. Make dua for me. And then suddenly you're alone. Suddenly you're like, like just silence around you. And you don't know which way to go, where to learn, how to learn, what to learn, what to do next. When are you getting married? You should be wearing hijab. Don't do that. Don't do this. I'm going to address a little bit later on. I have some do's and don'ts when dealing with new Muslims um, from my experiences of being in revert Facebook groups, <laughs> which I kind of make myself a, a mediator for. Um, but I have some advice, inshallah, so we can all help the newer Muslims in our community. So as you saw from my bio, I've been in media since I was 16. I've been in front of the camera and behind the camera, you know, since my late teen years. And about a year after I became Muslim, I decided to put on hijab. Uh, finally convinced my stubborn self that it's actually a requirement of Islam. <laughs> and I found myself, when I put on hijab, suddenly less desirable as on-screen talent. And it hurt. It hurt my ego, mostly. 
but it hurt, it hurt my confidence a lot. My boss at that time was not Muslim and did not appreciate me covering up my whiteness. I was a token that they used to put at the front to be like, ah, not anymore. And that judgmental question of, is this permanent? I found myself only being brought out to be paraded in front of Muslim delegations as their token revert, which hurt my confidence even more. And so I actually left being in front of the camera. Assalamu alaikum, Aisha. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Yeah. Thanks for stealing my spotlight, bro. <laughs> Aisha is actually one of the uh, presenters, alhamdulillah, that I casted for um, Salam Britain and mashallah, barakallah, she's, uh, she's amazing. So make sure you guys watch her. Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., Islam Channel. <laughs> so I left being in front of the camera. I abandoned something that was so much who I was because I no longer knew who I could be in that position. And like all reverts, I felt rejected by some and embraced by others. A whirlwind of love that is quite overwhelming as you lose yourself and find yourself and lose yourself and find yourself. And at this time is, of course, when the shayateen come and try to pull you back because you're vulnerable and you're alone. And so the waswas starts. And this is the most important time to learn how to deal with the waswas. Jennifer, mashallah, was talking about um, the critic, but to be honest, I call the critic the shayateen. <laughs> I feel like whenever I hear them going like, you can't do this, and I'm like, shut up. <laughs> so it'd be a few years before Allah actually inspired me back on camera. I floated around, I changed countries, I tried to find my place in the world as Nyla, leaving Vicky behind. And I ended up in the UAE, jobless, and couch surfing and going broke. You would think living in a Muslim country, being a hijabi wouldn't be an issue. But unfortunately, in the film industry, it is an issue, it's still an issue. Salam alaikum. I see you, girl. <laughs> Mashallah, barakallah. Naima B. Roberts just arrived, alhamdulillah. Can't wait for her talk. So I was trying to find a job and I kept getting rejected because I'm a hijabi. And the preconception of hijabis is that we're too conservative, we're not creative, we won't fit into the culture of the film industry, which is wrong, because I know what I bring to the table, alhamdulillah. And I know that I'm creative, alhamdulillah, by the will of Allah. So shaitan came, as he does when you're vulnerable, to take advantage of something you've done for the sake of Allah. And he said, take off your hijab. You'll get a job, and then you can put it on later. Just take it off for now. And I seriously considered it as my bank account dwindled away. But I said to Allah, I will not remove my hijab. I will not sacrifice and compromise my deen for this dunya, because I have tawakkul. I believe that Allah holds my risk in his hands and not the hands of people. And I know, Allah, that you will keep me safe and you will keep me not starving to death, at least. And even better, and Allah will provide. And so I kept my hijab on, alhamdulillah. I'm not one to say what Allah's rewards are or how Allah rewards us, but this is how I felt in the turn of events that had happened after that. My next interview I got was because my name was Victoria and I wore a hijab. In the UAE, you have to put your picture on your job app, on your uh, resumes. And so my future boss-to-be was so interested to know the story of Victoria the hijabi. And so he invited me in for an interview and we got along great with me and the two bosses and they hired me, alhamdulillah. Not only did I get a job because of my hijab, I ended up getting a reward in this dunya, alhamdulillah, that you read in my bio. Through that job, I got to work on the set of Star Wars 7. 
And this, when I applied for the job, I couldn't even make dua for that because we weren't even filming the new series of Star Wars at the time. So Allah knows me, Allah knows I grew up with Star Wars and being on set for that would be something I could never even comprehend. And Allah gave me that blessing. And I, I feel it was a reward for having pure tawakkal in him. Pure faith that he will always provide for each and one of us as long as we always believe and worship him. May Allah give me better in the akhirah, inshallah, and you, ameen. <laughs> so while I was in Dubai, I hopped over to Jordan, and I met a lovely woman who told me, I love your perspective, you should start a YouTube channel. I had not been in front of the camera since I left it those years ago. But her words kept ringing in my ears as I came back to Dubai. And I thought, why not? So I sat down, not in front of a camera, but in front of my webcam at the time on my laptop. And I did what we all do as reverts. And I told my revert story for two reasons. One, I got sick of repeating myself. <laughs> and now I can say, here's the link. And two, because it was a story that I wanted to share with people to hopefully inspire them. And there, Victoria of Islam, the YouTube channel, was started, alhamdulillah. Now, I started this channel as an attempt to change what I saw was wrong when I first converted, which was I couldn't see Islam in the Muslims around me. I was in such a community that they were not living the deen. They were not representatives in their character, behaviors, and morals of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so I started this whole live Islam sort of dawah to Muslims in a hopes that if we create a Muslim community that is so lovable and welcoming and helpful and beautiful like Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that people would just flock to the deen. So many times you hear people's revert stories because they had a beautiful Muslim neighbor or this Muslim helped them and it inspired them to look into the deen. Not long after this, I ended up in a very bad personal situation. My freedoms were taken away. Everything that made me who I was, everything I'd found in myself once again becoming a Muslim was taken away and chipped away at. I was made to disable my YouTube channel. I left my job. I became completely isolated. I knew no one here in the UK. And I lost all confidence to even find people to meet in the UK. After a couple of years, I wasn't even myself anymore. My friends didn't recognize me. I wasn't my bubbly personality, that bubbly Vicky who they'd always known. And I didn't even realize it was happening to me until I ended up in such deep depression and anxiety. It didn't help that it was the peak of the rise of Islamophobia a couple of years ago in Europe. So I was depressed, and I was anxious, and I didn't know who I was. And alhamdulillah, in that time, I got so low that I sought help. And I suggest anyone who's at that point to seek help. Mental health in the Muslim community should not be a, a stigma. You know, it shouldn't be taboo. And we can balance mental health support and spiritual help just like we do with physical health. It's my little plug for mental health support. <laughs> Not long ago, I actually found a notebook, an old notebook, and I was flipping through it, and I found a page that I had written at that time. And on that page, I wrote two columns, who I was and who I am. And under who I was was beautiful adjectives strong, confident, beautiful, friendly, happy, all these things. And under who I am was totally blank. And it spoke volumes to how I was feeling at that time. I no longer had purpose, identity, drive, vision. I didn't feel like I was a value to anything. I was a mom at that time and that was about it. And as most new moms will probably know, when you have a baby, nobody talks to you. They talk to your baby, they talk about your baby. You become this glorified babysitter, baby carrier even. And I remember a pivotal moment in my finding myself was when 
I first dropped my daughter to nursery. And I walked down to the coffee shop, and I spoke for about five minutes to that barista, <laughs> because it was the first time that I was me again. I didn't have this cute little baby that everybody wanted to talk to and talk about. It was only me. And I realized I missed that. I missed being someone who had something to bring to a conversation other than what my sleep schedule was for my kid. And I think that was the turning point. I don't remember exactly, but it's such a moment in my life that I remember that I think that was the final time when I said, oh Lord, have mercy. <laughs> All right, we gonna skip ahead. <laughs> I've got a couple of minutes left since we're running a bit behind. All right, where can we get to so we can be a benefit to you? So going to the mosque, I never felt like I could be me. Born Muslims who had been on the dean their entire lives, I felt like didn't understand me because of my Vicky side, my wayward hum hum humor, my a little bit off color humor. And so I started to look at what makes me and who did I want to be to bring myself into this ummah, into this world. I didn't want to fit into the box that people tried to force me into. So my career was important to me. I loved filmmaking. I loved working in the industry. But obviously, as a Muslim, you have some certain restrictions. You don't want to promote or encourage fitna in the world. So I limited my searches. But alhamdulillah, again, by sacrificing to Allah and not going for something haram, Allah opened up opportunities and doors for me. I started up my YouTube channel again, um, and I realized that dawah and sharing my life experience is what truly makes me happy in this world. It's, it's part of my identity that I had lost and I really needed to gain back. So I'm going to give a couple of bits of advice, inshallah, to wrap this up uh, before I pass the mic back over. Become okay with both your non-Muslim and your Muslim self. And whoever is good for you in your life will accept both of those. The old you may have done things that are not allowed in Islam, but there was good in you and Allah chose you to be blessed with Islam. Find all of the best bits from the past you and all of the best bits from the new you and mash them all together into one. Don't be ashamed of who you used to be. Allah has forgiven you, and anyone who isn't able to see past that isn't worth your time. Don't stop growing and evolving. Islam is a journey, and your life experiences are gifts from Allah to build you into an even stronger person. Bring your new you into your work, your life, and passions to create an even better version of yourself. The new you is who Allah wants you to be, and that in itself is a positive force. Be the role model and inspiration you needed to see at that time for others. Use your past experiences to enhance your new approach. Learn from your lessons and share those lessons with others. Use your love for your halal life to inspire those struggling to stay away from haram. There's an epidemic now of hijabi influencers who get famous for wearing hijab and then the shayateen comes and makes them take off their hijab. This is a very, very scary kind of arch we're seeing nowadays. And so we need the most positive force of support for modesty and Islamic values, inshallah, for one another. All right, so a couple of things to not do when you meet a new revert. Marriage. They do not need to get married. <laughs> they don't know who they are, so how can they know who they want to marry? They don't know what makes a good Muslim man and they don't know how to find a good Muslim man and look out for red flags. So let them find themselves before they have to find a husband. Zainab, may Allah be pleased with her, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was married to a man named Abu Al-As ibn Al-Rabi, who was very beloved by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She converted and he did not because he said, if I convert now, people will say I've left my traditions to please my wife. Now, the command to not marry a non-Muslim did not actually come down for more than 10 years after Islam was first revealed. And so they lived together until the migration, uh, until she was asked to migrate because of this new commandment after the Battle of Badr. 
So if Allah gave them more than 10 years for their partner to find Islam, let Muslims who are new Muslims who are married to non-Muslims find themselves, give their partner a chance to find Islam too, before you start telling them, sister, divorce him. You're going to commit zina. Allah is the best at da'wah. Allah gave da'wah to the Sahaba. Let's follow the example of how Allah gave da'wah. First and foremost, worship Allah alone. Let the rest come slowly. It's a very, we're chasing people away from the deen with this very like hard line. SubhanAllah. What's your new name? A good name in Islam is, divine by, is, is defined by a name that has a good meaning and does not associate others with Allah. Yeah? Not an Arab name, <laughs> not an Asian name, a good name. So if the sister or brother's name is good, let them keep it. It's their identity. It's their family's identity. They don't need a new name. I'm almost done. Don't bug me. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. <laughs> and that nicely brings me on to culture. If someone in your family marries a revert, or you marry a revert, which is a very big responsibility and should not be taken as like a token or like a prize, which it often is. They come with their own family, culture, traditions. And as long as those don't go against Islam, merge them with your own. Don't overwhelm them with the born Muslim culture and, and make them leave everything they've ever known. Integrate their Christmas morning traditions into your Eid morning traditions. Let them feel like their culture is as important as it is to yours because Allah made us tribes and nations so that we may know each other, not so we may change each other. Don't judge a book by its cover and don't judge a revert on their past. We all have a past, some we're proud of, some we're not proud of. But Allah has forgiven everything in a revert's past once they have submitted to Allah. And Allah loves us turning back to him and seeking forgiveness so much that it was reported by Abu Huraira that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, by the one in whose hand is my soul, if you did not sin, Allah would replace you with people who would sin and they would seek forgiveness from Allah and he would forgive them. So if you see a revert with tattoos or whatever, don't start pushing them to get a painful procedure that will cost them their bank account for something that Allah has already forgiven them for. Accept them as they came into this deen. Allah prohibited things in stages, and therefore we also must allow them to take their steps in stages too. Whatever it is that I'm going through, and whatever I feel is missing from my life, that void should be filled with Allah first and foremost. The moment I turn to anyone or anything else for a sense of fulfillment, Allah out of His mercy allows me to be disappointed sooner or later. The minute I stop relying on people and submit fully to Allah, I find a solution for my problem. The only one in this entire universe who will never disappoint you is Allah. In obedience to Allah, I find sanctity. In submitting to His unmatched power, I find peace. In Allah's mercy and forgiveness, I am filled with love. In seeking guidance from His endless knowledge and wisdom, I find clarity. And in Allah's limitless generosity and blessings, I find eternal happiness. But you cannot obey one whom you do not love, and you cannot love one whom you do not know. To start knowing yourself and on your journey to finding yourself, make sure that you do not neglect the one who made you to begin with. The only way to truly find the best version of yourself is to seek Allah and to know Allah. Jazakallah khair for your attention and your patience and your quietness. <laughs> and may Allah forgive me for any mistakes that I've made and any wrongs I've said today. May you all forgive me and I pray that whatever I said today was at least a little bit of a benefit to all of you. May Allah guide you all to find your best self, inshallah.